Today we are thrilled to be joined by Jay White, Senior Director of Software Engineering at Blackboard. Blackboard is a global education technology company headquartered in Washington, D.C. Jay has been with Blackboard for over 12 years and his portfolio includes an education data link and a suite of analytics products drawing insights from that student and learning data center. Jay and Blackboard engaged with Snowflake to support their new data strategy initiative over three years ago. Uh, an interesting thing to note is that Blackboard was Snowflake's beachhead customer in the Australian market. Today, Jay is going to talk to us about Blackboard's data strategy. Without further ado, Jay, off to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Hello and welcome to everyone. Um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes today about how Blackboard is using Snowflake to unify data, people, and technology in this new era of data. So Blackboard is a leader in the global education technology space and as was mentioned, I'm responsible for our, our analytics products as well as our open source product teams. Um, Blackboard's flagship product is a learning management solution called Blackboard Learn. If you've had any kind of formal education in the last 15 or 20 years, there's a good chance that uh, your studies had some level of digital presence. Maybe that was just a syllabus online or maybe you had a fully online experience where you took tests and quizzes and studied from digital content engaged in discussion forums and that kind of stuff. Well, if any of that resonates, uh, you were using Blackboard Learn or, or one of our competitors. Aside from the learning management solution, um, Blackboard can sell you hardware on campus for door and building access and food purchases from your student ID. Uh, now you can even put your student ID in your iOS, Apple wallet and uh, get building access and pay for food uh, with the tap of your phone. We've got um, collaboration tools and mobile products, we've got some great accessibility products. Uh, we've got services that students can call or chat with to get financial aid or other administrative information on campus. Basically, if it's technology and it's at a place of learning, there's a good chance Blackboard has a product. Um, all that means to me as the analytics guy is I've got access to one of the largest education data sets in the world. So I'll cut right to the architecture and then we can get into the more fun stuff. Uh, so how are we bringing this data-centric portfolio to life at Blackboard? Well, at the very core is Snowflake. Uh, we've instrumented each of our products and many of our partners to hydrate our Snowflake data lake with all that data about behaviors and actions and interactions. Uh, we're currently using Airflow to orchestrate all this data movement and we're starting to explore using Snowflake Snowpipe to make that even easier. Uh, Airflow drives a ELT process, extract load transform, uh, where we're taking basically any raw data we can get our hands on, loading it in in its native form, either structured or semi-structured JSON, and then we cut our data scientists and data engineers loose on automating transformations that magically turn that essentially useless raw data into open, actionable, intentional information and insights. We're building inside of Snowflake uh, an instance of a holistic educational canonical model for each of our thousands of institutions. And we're in the process of leveraging Snowflake's data sharing capability to attempt to create a data, econ data economy between institutions and vendors in this space. I figure we'll talk a little bit about this in the Q&A, but I'll just leave this here. Snowflake allows us to do all of this work with these large data sets at a performance level and cost price point that frankly, were it not for Snowflake, I'm not convinced this vision would be possible. So you might be thinking, well, that sounds lovely, Jay, for you and Blackboard and the millions of learners around the world, but tell me how can I use data in my space to build a defensible business? Well, lucky for you, I put the answer right there on the slide, but I should explain a little bit more. Allow me to borrow a bit from one of my heroes, Andrew Ng, who is the chief scientist at Baidu, led the Google Brain Project, co-founded Coursera, et cetera, where he teaches AI digitally. The secret sauce here is really explained far better by Andrew, so hit YouTube and search Andrew Ng and prepare to go down a pretty cool rabbit hole. I'll do my best to lay some of it out here, but strap on, strap in, sorry, things get rather complicated. In the 90s and 2010s, it was a very exciting time for IT. 
it was the internet era and all the cool kids were throwing down and crushing dot com code. And many of them were failing at first. You see, there was a very important math equation that we eventually learned during this time. A shopping mall plus a website does not equal an internet company. It turns out that what really defines an internet company is whether or not you've architected your organization to leverage internet capabilities. So for example, we learned that to do the internet well, you ought to be doing user experience A-B testing. It's the only way to really know that what you're building is the thing that your customers want the most. We learned that you need to take advantage of the capabilities that the internet gives you to have short cycle times, even approaching continuous delivery. Even uh, monthly releases is the, the silliness of old, big, monolithic enterprise applications. The internet is nimble and changing, and you need to organize around that change. And in order to be nimble and make rapid change, you need to push decision making down from the CEO to the line level engineers and product managers that you trust will do the right thing or at least fail fast. Well, welcome to the rise of the data era. No one has completely figured this out yet, what, you know, what truly makes a, an AI or data company, but as expected, there's another complex math equation that we're beginning to figure out. And that is that an internet company plus some AI or machine learning or deep learning or neural network or whatever does not equal a data company. Just like in the internet era, there were there are ways that we have to architect our organization to leverage new capabilities. Andrew Wing points out four uh, key things that I completely agree with. First, in order to be successful in the data era, we need to write new job descriptions. There are obvious things like cloud fabric management, data orchestration, data visualization, but there are other more subtle things. I'll tell you a story, at Blackboard, uh, we were building a very interesting AI-driven chatbot that students can chat with to get answers to questions they have about their financial aid forms or important dates for various administrative paperwork or what's happening on campus, et cetera. Our product managers created an initial, an initial requirement spec that had a very lovely wireframe showing you know, the student others a question, the chatbot responds with the right answer. Okay, engineers, go build it, do that AI thing. That makes no sense, right? It's like me sketching out the concept drawing of a new car, handing it off to the manufacturing team and saying, here's, all, here's the new car to build. You see all the details I put in there. And also, by the way, make it self-driving. DMs have a whole new way to think about requirements that most likely includes delivering to the engineering team some realistic data sets they can use to train models and craft and draw insights from. Bottom line, there needs to be a culture change that builds into business rules the inherent need to make data-driven decisions. Secondly, have you, uh, have you read the State of DevOps report? Uh, if not, you should because Real data shows that DevOps-minded organizations are succeeding and everyone else is struggling. I told you a little bit about the hundreds, if not thousands, of moving pieces in and around Blackboard's data lake. To survive in the data era, you must wholeheartedly commit to pervasive automation. Fully automated test coverage, automated deployment pipelines, mature CI CD, you know, reduced cycle times, limited WIP, and, and essentially a tenacious uh, reduction of, of unplanned work. There is no way to succeed in the data era without world-class DevOps and, and engineering performance thinking. Driving down cycle times is, is really the only way to allow for the experimentation required to find the real value in your data. Third, is the strategic, if not vicious, cycle of data acquisition. In this data era, you need data and lots of data to build a great product, train predictions, and, and truly draw insights. In order to get lots and lots of data, you need lots of users generating data. And in order to have lots of users generating data, you need to have great products. It's a cycle where the more you have of the previous thing, the better the thing will be. Uh, you need to push your organizations 
to add data acquisition to what has typically been a just a revenue expense decision rule for our new products or features. You'll find that you even offer some products or features for free just to kickstart this cycle. And then you begin thinking three and four chess moves out. Build this product to collect this data, to build this other product, to finally build this other product to finally profit. This is the model that the winners in the data era around the world are using. The strategic data acquisition cycle is critical because data itself is the currency of the data era. Fourth, and finally, you need to unify all these data in a central warehouse that simultaneously has the right governance in place to keep things organized and within privacy compliance regulations, but also is available to your organization. If you've got 50 different data marks under the control of 50 different VPs, um, you will not win in the data era. It's just plain inefficient. But this central storage needs to be able to scale and perform without driving cogs out of control. That's why partnering with the right vendor in this space will make or break your organization in the new era of data. So that's, that's uh, what I have prepared. Uh, thanks for letting me talk at you a little bit this morning. I'd love to try to field some questions. Absolutely, Jay, and, and thanks for that presentation. Uh, one of the things that I picked up on, uh, and this will get into the, the first question that was answered, is um, I liked your slide about how Internet company plus an ML AI company does not equal a data company, and we uh, are fully aware of that. So what are some of the other lessons that you've learned along the way? So did you actually implement a new solution? Did you guys uh, migrate from an existing solution? Talk about that journey that you guys uh, went on to actually decide on Snowflake. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the, the, the point of that slide and what I was trying to, what I'm trying to drive, drive home here is that that leveraging data to build a defensible business really requires organizing around that data value stream. So, um, and, and, and that means organizing the entire business, not just the, the, uh, the engineering side of the house. So, you know, one, one of the things that we learned very early is that, um, is that in, order to, in order to build great products uh, from, from data, we need to really have a, a deep understanding of, of the value of those insights and how those insights are being, being used by our customers. Um, so that, that really requires a, a data-minded design and research team that requires data-minded product managers and, uh, and executive leadership and it, it really just it really just requires pervasive data driven decision make, making at, at a cultural level across the organization. Uh, it's it's a thing that that I know Blackboard was was certainly not used to um, as we entered into this journey. And and I think we're beginning to we're we're beginning to really achieve the necessary culture changes that that we need to, uh, especially around injecting into our decision-making process, the ideas uh, of data acquisition and, and how, uh, how data, you know, unrelated data that, that seemingly maybe has no value on its own combined with other things can really provide some very rich insights to, to our customers. Jay, that's, uh, that's very helpful. Um, that goes to the, it's related to the, another question that came in, and you talked about how unrelated data can be combined to create new insights, but that requires a lot of data sharing. And can you talk a little bit about what you guys plan to do with Snowflake data sharing and what are some challenges that you're trying to solve with data sharing? Yeah. So we're, we're super excited about the, the data sharing capabilities of Snowflake. Um, you know, historically, uh, the movement of data from from one place to another, either within an organization or kind of in a in a B two B or B two C scenario, we, historically we've always spent a massive amount of cycle time just dealing with the plumbing, 
um, figuring out the the right file structure for your for your your data payloads and and working out all the permissions of an FTP site or an S3 bucket or that sort of thing. And then then there was always the latency uh, that's kind of injected into that kind of system where where you know I I may be able to send someone a new data set on a daily basis or something, uh, and then they, they've got a big process to consume it. Um, Snowflake data sharing really changes the game for us because with a matter of uh, some really minor configuration, I'm now able to, um, to have the most recent and up-to-date data set delivered to a customer or a partner um, instantly. Uh, you know, I kind of, the way I describe this internally and, and with some of our customers is it's kind of like uh, in a traditional database, it's kind of like just having a view to a table. And that's essentially what it is, uh, at least for us in, in Snowflake. So, what, you know, what, what we're thinking that this will allow us to do and, and something that we're prototyping with a handful of schools around the world is um, this, this allows us at Blackboard to focus on what we're good at, um, amassing, aggregating, and you know, manufacturing some insights and injecting those insights into a data set, and then leveraging the data sharing capability so that a school can pick up that data set and then uh, inside their own Snowflake account um, make whatever customization or modification or tweaks to that data to, to solve whatever problems they're facing or to answer whatever questions they're facing. This sort of takes the, the middleman out of it. It makes it so that I'm not, I'm not charging my customers for, for infrastructure. They're paying for what they use. Uh, I'm not running operations team that's, that's receiving pages about a, uh, an FTP file load that didn't, a file upload that didn't work. And instead, I'm, I'm focusing my engineering team's effort on um, manufacturing and, and delivering insights to customers. Okay, super helpful. Um, and just a reminder, as you guys think of new questions, please do chat us in the, in the console. Um, so related to that, and I like how you connected the, the education component to it, one of the questions that came in is, uh, what are some insights that you can share with us on how to implement rules across multiple departments, multiple disciplines in a university setting? I'm sorry, I missed the word in the question, how to implement what? Rules across multiple departments, across multiple disciplines in a university setting. Oh, rules. Like uh, we're talking about data governance here, right? Yes. Yeah. So, um, I mean, so that's a that's a great question, and probably at the eternal struggle of any data practitioner, right? And and it's not something that that any vendor is going to solve necessarily for anybody. Um, the things that I found most successful in in my experience and and in in Blackboard's experience is that centralizing data um, in, into a data lake built on Snowflake allows us to prescribe a, a data governance set of patterns and practices that, that can be applied universally. And that really, that really draws down on, on the churn that's typically associated with, with rules handshake across business units. Um, you know, there, there is no way to avoid the fact that you, you get three people in a room from three different departments and ask them, you know, uh, what, what's the definition of an enrolled student, and you'll get three different <laughs> answers. Uh, that, that, is, that is a fact of life, I think, um, for any data practitioner. But centralizing data um, in, in, a, in a scalable way like this allows you to really codify those rules in a governance practice that that is a lot more manageable than than trying to um, draw some sort of cross rules crosswalk across multiple data marks. Sounds like uh, um, you you got your handful with that. 
Uh, changing sure. gears, uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, a couple of the similar questions came in. So can you describe your ETL implementation in both ingestion into Snowflake and, and ETL or view creation within Snowflake? So really getting into the nuts and bolts of the um, extract, transmit, and load process. Okay. Yeah, so we, we are using a an extract load transform model uh, more than a an ETL model. Um, and, and that really has to do with the fact that Snowflake allows us to um, inject uh, source data or raw data in, in a number of different formats, either you know structured or, or semi-structured. Um, so the, the way we the way we have things instrumented is is we have a we have a, a data pipeline uh, that that. Um, the intention is for all of Blackboard's products to to use the same pipeline, and, and you know, full transparency, we're still ramping up towards that. But um, we should be able to we'll be able to generate metrics and and data extracts out of each of the products uh, into into S3, and then today we have Airflow picking data up from S3, bringing it into Snowflake raw from the products, and then we're also using Airflow to orchestrate the, uh, the execution of, of any transformation code into the final canonical model that, that exists within, within Snowflake. Um, we have, we uh, have most of our data infrastructure in AWS's Cloud Fabric, and we have spent a significant amount of time um, prototyping uh, step functions, Lambda step functions as an alternative to Airflow. Uh, the team is in the process of coming to a, a point of view on that. And then also <clears throat> there's some new features coming from Snowflake that we're really excited about that, that ought to be able to allow us to, to automate not only the ingestion of that data, but also uh, a significant amount of the process and steps inside of that ELT pipeline. Does that answer the question? I think so, Jay, and I, I, I appreciate that you alluded to the new features coming up. So definitely a lot on the roadmap here. Um, one of the other questions that we had is how are warehouses utilized and or what functions are they performing in your implementation? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> I think the best way to describe that is is we use compute uh, from from Snowflake um, in the in the ELT process uh, we have compute separated and and managing a, a specific number of of client ELT from various products at a time and that's 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 sort of load balanced against. Uh, against the compute cluster inside of Snowflake, and then also it's something that we we monitor and and are making some. We're we're applying that pervasive automation that I talked about to to scale that um, as needed. On the on the consumption side of these data sets, um, we have uh, we have a compute layer that's that's specifically responsible for visualization of data uh, for various products that that are built on top of Snowflake. So you know in terms of in terms of the data itself, we've got data from different institutions logically separated at storage layer uh, and then and then compute is, is more shared across uh, across the architecture. That sounds great, Jay. So um, just digging ourselves out of the weeds a little bit here, one of the uh, questions that we get pretty often is, what are some of the early successes and how did you measure success uh, from your use of Snowflake? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. So <clears throat> uh, I, I think one of our earliest successes is, is interesting. We've had sort of an interesting journey with Snowflake. We we POC'd and and 
purchased our first set of ball credits from Snowflake with the full intention of replacing an existing product that we had in our portfolio that was a data warehouse and, and BI product built on the, the Microsoft um, you know, SQL Server stack. It turns out that at, at the same time as we did that initial uh, purchase of credits and then began the process of of that re, of that um, reengineering of that existing product, Blackboard also went out and acquired a predictive analytics company, and uh, and sort of dropped that on my team's lap and said, "Here's here's a." a a, a capability that we would like to offer as part of the Blackboard brand, but we need you to rewrite it. Um, we were able to, uh, and you know, incidentally, what this product does is it, it ingests uh, some bio demo information about students, activity uh, information about students from within their course, and then uh, returns a prediction of whether or not the student will pass a course with a C or better. And uh, the intention here is for this to be used by advisors who, um, who you know, an advisor on a, on a typical North American higher ed campus has five or 600 advisees, and it's, it's awfully helpful to, to have uh, the data tell you which 10 or so they should, they should go engage with first to get them back on track for retention purposes. So, you know, in terms of measures, uh, measure of success, we were able to completely rewrite that application that, that came in through that acquisition and deliver it within Blackboard's architecture built on top of Snowflake. In about, uh, in about two quarters worth of time, uh, we went from, from signing acquisition to doing a live demo of this uh, at our big annual conference in, in about six months. And that was a thing that, that really, that sort of rapid development and and delivery was something that was very new to Blackboard and um, was definitely uh, was definitely a thing that we could call successful. Um, you know, in terms of in terms of ongoing measures of success, uh, we look a lot at at cogs, and uh, we're moving more and more product capabilities, um, especially related to reporting. From our individual product infrastructure to our Snowflake data lake and 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 the, the Snowflake architecture, and as we see those cogs come down as we make that move, that's another thing that we and not only the the cogs come down, but the performance increase is another thing that that um, I often get measured on. Jane, that's, uh, that's really good to hear that the time to market has been uh, shortened to six months. That seems like really a rapid development cycle. So I know we're at 1030, a little over 1031. Um, I do have a couple of other questions that were follow up to your answers. So I do want to um, get to that question, understand if people need to uh, drop off. Again, their deck and recording will be made available after the session. So one of the questions that came in as a follow up was, how does Blackboard actually track costs as far as Snowflake credits for compute resources are concerned? Um, how are you guys actually, um, right, did you spin up a virtual warehouse? How does the cost model work uh, in conjunction with Blackboard? Yeah, so, um, you know, this is, I, I've, I've said a, a lot, about a half an hour's worth of really positive things about Snowflake. This is one area that, that I think could be improved, and and based on my information, it is it is being improved. There within the Snowflake um, console, there is uh, there is some very good and accurate information on on credit burn, uh, broken down by by warehouse, um, and then and there's also storage uses. Um, you know, one of the things that I need to be able to do is understand my COGS at a client level. So if I've got a thousand, a thousand higher ed institutions with data uh, in, in my Snowflake data lake, 
um, which you know I have in multiple AWS regions uh, in Sydney and Frankfurt uh, in the U.S. I, I need to be able to really understand um, uh, compute and storage uh, broken down at a finer grain level. Um, and that, that information is not readily available through the Snowflake console directly. However, all of that information is, uh, you, you can get from, um, from metadata that, that any Snowflake customer has access to their own metadata. So my team has built um, some, some cost or, or COGS dashboards that, that we keep an eye on very regularly, not only with our overall credit burn, but uh, with some more finer grain detail around the various Blackboard products that are using the data lake and then the various customers that are consuming. So we've, we've built some dashboards ourselves out of, uh, out of metadata that is available. I'd love to see that rolled into the product one day, but in the meantime, we've, we've managed on our own. Absolutely, Jay, and I think that's the beauty of these office hours is that you're not just talking about what's great about Snowflake, which it is obviously very good, um, but you're talking about the areas of improvement and um, just having a kind of a conversation. So I do, we do appreciate that. Um, we are a little uh, above 1030, so um, I know literally two questions just trickled in at, in the last couple of minutes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get um, those questions over to our speaker, Jay, and we'll uh, We'll make sure that those are addressed. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time, especially Jay. Thank you for being our presenter, and uh, thanks for all the attendees. Have a great day, everyone. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.